yeah, my name's Rom, and uh, I'm one of the guys that'll get to preach to you this uh, retreat. Um, we've got a team of guys that'll come out, but I think John already mentioned it. We're going to be in the Gospels, specifically looking at the miracles and signs of Jesus. So in, in just a little bit, we'll be in John chapter 6, if you want to turn there. But I, I wanted to first talk a little bit about, like, okay, what are miracles? What are the, what are the purpose of of miracles, if you've ever just stopped and wondered, okay, if you've heard the stories, if you've read the Gospels, and you've learned about Christ, and have you ever paused and go, okay, why? Like, why did Jesus show up doing all these things, like all these supernatural acts? And, well, it got me thinking, and, and as my kids were little, uh, with each one of them, I've read through the Chronicles of Narnia with them when they were kids, and uh, it was always always good, and I enjoyed it, and you know, getting to see those stories through their eyes, and and I and it made me think of the first book, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So if you're familiar with them, you'll know what I'm talking about. But if not, like, it's this, and some of you, this is going to be hard. It's this uh, fictitious place called Narnia, uh, not not actually a real place uh, that has been created. And there's all these animals and like mythical creatures that talk and, you know, are like people. Um, well, it comes under the reign of this evil witch, right? And, and the worst part about it, like throughout that first book, it keeps saying um, what in her, under her evil rule, it's winter and never Christmas. The point is it's cold, it's dead, and it has all the joy of life like sucked out of it. And so... They're under this rule of this evil witch until these four uh, kids, these siblings, two boys, two girls, uh, are brought from our world, not in reality, just in the story, into this place called Narnia. And it, it triggers these events. And what happens is like these kids meet these beavers, naturally, and, and they find out like this was all like part of these prophecies where these two sons of Adam and these two daughters of Eve were going to come in. And so they already start to celebrate because they think, well, this is going to be, this is going to lead to the end of the witch's reign. And sure enough, as they spend more time in Narnia, things start to happen. These signs start to appear where the snow is melting, the, the rivers are thawing, the evil witch who goes around on a sleigh, she can't use it anymore because there's no more snow. And they're all signs that the hero is on the way. And the fact that he's already come and he's come to save them from this evil witch, that Aslan has come. And so it just got me thinking like, okay, yeah, like those were all signs. They're pointing to something like this rescue that was on the way. And I think that's what C.S. Lewis was, was getting at is, yeah, why, why did Jesus come and do all these amazing things? I mean, even what we just celebrated. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, we just celebrated at Christmas. I get choked up just thinking about Christmas. <clears throat> it's got nothing to do with being sick for like three weeks. And and I like we're right th that we celebrate Christmas with that this girl, this virgin girl. Conceived a son by the power of the Holy Spirit, and the son is God in the flesh, that the beginning of his life is a miracle. All the way to the end, the book ends with the resurrection where Jesus comes back from the dead, just like he said. And everything in between, whether he's feeding people with food from nothing or giving sight to the blind, healing the lame, literally raising the dead, all these things are pointing to something greater. Listen to this. So this is from Jesus in Luke chapter 7, and it's after his ministry has started. And John the Baptist has been in prison, and John's like, okay, time out. Like, okay, I know this was the Messiah, but why am I sitting in jail? <laughs> like, I thought he was supposed to come and free us, to save us. And, and John himself didn't have a full picture of what the ministry of Christ was going to be. And so he sends some of his friends to go to Jesus and ask him, hey, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you our king come to save us? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And listen to what Jesus says in response. And he, Jesus, answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. 
the blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. What's Jesus saying? He's referring to these passages from the Old Testament that promised when the king comes, these are going to be the things that start to happen. What kind of things? Things that show that he's come to undo the curse. He's come to reverse the effects of sin coming into the world. Listen to this. Jesus' response to John the Baptist teaches us the purpose of his miracles. He was not just showing off his divine power in order to solve temporary problems. His miracles were a fulfillment of prophecies. They were a sign that he was, in fact, the promised Messiah. He is the king come to save his people. The miracles of Jesus were a sign of his authority, his power, and his glory. Listen to what Peter said after the resurrection of Jesus. He's preaching to all these people in Jerusalem who had experienced this. They had, maybe th some of these people were even folks that, like in our text tonight that we're going to get to, where Jesus feeds the 5,000 with bread and fish out of like this one small meal. Like maybe that some of these guys were there. Maybe some of these guys saw when this kid was dead and Jesus spoke to her and brought her back to life. Peter preaches and he says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless or sinful men. God raised him up, freeing him from the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So I want to look at we've seven things here that we see from the miracles of Christ that we can learn as we walk through in this retreat, all these different miracles and signs of Jesus. We're going to see these seven things over and over again that we're to learn from them. The first is what we just read, that Miracles are witnesses from God to us that Jesus is who we claim to be. That through the miracles of Christ, God is actually attesting to us that Jesus is who he claims to be. That he is the son of God. That he is the only way of salvation. In fact, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us that God bears witness of what? That Jesus brings the gospel, that he brings the good news, and that he bore witness by signs and wonders, that the miracles are like God's stamp of approval. In fact, in John 6, it says that it's God setting his seal on Jesus. He's showing us, oh no, he's legit. Everything he says, everything he does, everything he claims, you can trust and believe. Number two, Miracles announce the arrival of the kingdom of Christ, that his kingdom has started. It was unlike Narnia, we're not under the frozen reign of an evil witch. But what that children's story is pointing to is that this world, the, <laughs> the real one that we live in, we are under a curse. And we are under the rule and reign of an evil tyrant. The, the reality is that, yeah, we have an enemy. And the Bible paints this picture that it's this kingdom of darkness. And that every human being born into this world is born into slavery, to sin, and to that darkness. And we live underneath this weight, this fear of death the consequence of our own sin and a, a judgment beyond that death. And what the miracles are showing is yet the snow is melting, the river's thawing. Jesus is undoing the curse of sin and he's bringing in a kingdom where those things will not exist. And so when he's healing the blind, 
He's taking somebody's broken body and making it whole. Literally bringing someone back from death. He's showing, yeah, like the results of the curse, all the effects of sin in your life, he will undo. Why? Because he has the authority and the power and the grace and the mercy to do it. Number three, to fulfill Old Testament prophecies about the promised Messiah. What Jesus himself referred to in that passage we read, that, that God had been sowing these seeds in people's thoughts and minds throughout the Old Testament that the Messiah is coming, and this is what he'll be like. Number four, they served to illustrate Christ's teaching about his kingdom and his redemption. That in feeding people food, right, to meet a basic need of hunger, that he's showing, yeah, there, there's a deeper spiritual hunger that needs to be satisfied. And giving somebody physical sight, he's showing us, you know, that there, there's a spiritual blindness that needs to be healed. Number five, to show that he is ultimately undoing the consequences of the fall. Number six, to show his glory as the Son of God. No doubt what should come to all of our minds as we watch Jesus perform these miracles is, yeah, he, he's truly human. He's born of a virgin. He's a real human being, but he is absolutely God. He's the second person of the triune God come to save us, and he puts his power on display as he supernaturally does these things, which is to me, encouraging. Like, I, I love when people say stuff like, yeah, but what about all the miracles in, in the Bible? Like, do you really believe, like, Jesus walked on water? Like, that's crazy. People don't walk on water. Uh, right. That was kind of the whole point. Like, if it was normal and natural, he would have done something else, right? Like, of course, like, if you start with, if, if you and I start with, in the beginning, God created out of the power of his word. He creates the universe. If he has the power to do that, if God can create and establish the natural order, then he has the power and the authority to step out of that and override it and supersede it. And it's what we see through Jesus. Jesus is the word. He's the one who spoke. He, he, he's the one who made this place. He has all power and authority over it. He's demonstrating who he is. He's the son of God. Number seven, the miracles serve to ultimately, ultimately lead us to believe in Jesus Christ for our personal salvation. All these awesome reasons and things that we gain from seeing and hearing of the miracles of Christ. But nothing's more important than this. If we don't get this, none of, none of the else, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you celebrate Christmas and think, yeah, man, I, I love the story of the Savior coming in the world. That doesn't matter if it doesn't lead you to personally submit to and receive Jesus as your Savior. So let's dive in to our first story. It's from John chapter 6. It's called The Feeding of the 5,000. So you, you're probably familiar with it. If you've been at church at all, you probably heard this story read. And uh, it's cool because aside from the resurrection, this is the only other miracle that shows up in all four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the on, only other one. So I think it's very significant. And it's cool, too, because you can read all the different accounts and kind of harmonize them, blend them all together, and you get this full picture each gospel writer tells it or like leaves some details in and takes some details out because of the angle that they're wanting to tell the story from but if you put them all together you get this awesome picture of what's going on because even that we call it the feeding of the 5,000 that's not really accurate that's not really accurate because what Matthew tells us is the, there is 5,000 men besides the women and the children so, if you've got 5,000 men, how many women do you think were there, roughly? About 5,000. All right, so we're up to 
10. All right. Thank you, Chris. Now, when you get men and women together, what can you also assume there's going to be? Children, right? And so who knows? Back in the day, like, people had whole, like, now if somebody has nine kids, they're always posting about it on social media and bragging and telling you how hard it, I'm, I'm sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I spent too much time alone on the internet this week. Okay. Back then, that was normal. That wasn't, that didn't stand out. Like, you wouldn't post that. It was, everybody had six to nine kids. Yeah, who knows, man? You could be talking, like, conservatively, like, 20, 25,000 people. And, and the region that he's in, maybe there wouldn't normally be that many people, but what we learn is this is the time of the Passover, and so people are traveling to Jerusalem, and where Jesus currently is is, like, en route. And so he's performing all these miracles, he's healing people, he's casting out demons, and word is spreading like, hey, this guy, this guy named Jesus from Nazareth, like the one that I think John the Baptist was telling us about, like he's doing all these crazy things just like, just like the prophets told us the Messiah would do. Is this, could this be him? And so people that were already on their way to celebrate the Passover are coming out to see Jesus. And that's where we pick up. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick, healing people. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. So basically like a year's wages, like my entire salary, if I took that and went and bought bread, still no one's getting full. Like that's enough for everyone just to have a little bit of food. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted, and when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him and force him to be king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. All right, so, yeah, on the surface, this, this is a crazy story. Like, this, this doesn't happen, right? People, people don't do this. But you see the scene that's being set where this huge crowd is in front of Jesus. 20, 25,000 people, men, women, children, and they've got nothing to eat. And it's like, Man, do they just not plan for the trip? Or I, what I think is, man, that yeah, they heard about Jesus and they're drawn to him. This wasn't in their plans. They weren't planning on going out to this to this area that it's not a desert, but it wasn't populated. There wasn't like a, a, a town right there. There was like they would have to travel to get food. This wasn't their destination initially, but they're drawn to Jesus because of the healings that he's doing. And Jesus is testing his disciples he's saying hey we got we have to feed these people and even though they've seen all these awesome things that jesus have, has already done they still don't get it and andrew brings this boy to jesus and says hey he's got <laughs> he's got five barley loaves i laugh every time i say it because in my mind still like every picture bible that i've ever seen every like cartoon version of this story the kids carrying around like large, uh, like th- it looks like French bread, like loaves of like you know, like if you get at the grocery store and the paper sleeve, and which the French weren't making that bread back then. 
uh, these barley loaves are basically like crackers. They're small crackers that really were most people, even in Israel, looked down on. Like that was like a poor person's meal. It was like the bare minimum of ingredients that you needed to make something that you could carry with you and eat. And so he took that and he just begins to break it. And, and I don't know, like you could only speculate of what this looked like. I mean, were the people that were up close, did they see like food just continue to come out of his hands? Like every time he broke it, there was just more and more and more. And I mean, because this bar, uh, l- let me let me read you this. This is from a book called uh, Mercy Revealed, A Cross-Centered Look at Christ's Miracles. I, l- I, l- I like the way he says this. Natural processes that normally took a season to complete, sowing seed, growing grain, harvesting, threshing, baking bread, were compressed into a second under the mighty hand of the word made flesh. What normally took over a span of months in the hidden recesses of the Sea of Galilee, fish hatching, maturing, then being caught by trolling fishermen, all took place instantaneously in the hand of the creator who had formed the sea and dry land and filled them with life. This is cool to think about, to try to picture. Like the fish that these people were eating, they never swam. They never swam. The bread that they were eating, like it was never grain to be harvested. It it didn't start as a seed. Jesus is taking this boy's meal and creating more food. It's just, it, <laughs> it's a miracle. It really is amazing. And we should not get tired of hearing these stories. But here's where we, we don't want to take a left turn at the story. We, we, we don't want to miss the point of the miracle. We don't want to make the mistake of like, So the story all of a sudden becomes about this boy who shares his food. Like, we don't even know that he gave it up willingly. Like, people standing by might be like, hey, uh, did Jesus just take that kid's lunch? And now he's lifting it up to heaven, thanking God for it? Like, what is going on? Like, we don't know. That boy just shows up. Like, he's got food. He's the only one in the crowd, and the Lord takes it. He's not the point of the story. Should you share? Sometimes, <laughs> yeah, mo- most, most of the time, most, it, it's nice to share. I'm trying, I try to teach that to my kids. I'm not always good at teaching by my example. Like at night, like if, if they want ice cream, I tax that, absolutely. But my bowl of ice cream, mm-mm, Jack, you're not coming back with all your digits if you try to scoop some of my ice cream, right? Like, yeah, in general, it's nice to share. That's not the point of the story. It's, the, it's not. It, it, there's other places to go in Scripture to learn that. Not here. What's happening? Jesus is teaching us something about himself. And what's interesting is they start to get it. The people start to get it. What do they say? What are they saying? Is there, it says they eat their fill. Like, basically, they're stuffed. They're like all of us were a couple nights ago. Like, they're stuffed. They're, they're like, no more. I can't eat anymore. So that people that don't have a lot to eat in general at this time, this place, these, these Israelites, they're filled to the brim. Like they're stuffed so that the disciples are taking up the leftovers and fill these baskets full. Like, and as they're finishing up, they're going, is this, wait a second. He just gave us bread out of nowhere. And for them, their mind would have raced back to Old Testament stories and to a prophecy about a, pro- a prophet who would come who was like Moses, but greater. And you remember who Moses was. Well, what, what, what would have triggered that thought? What was the memory? They would have remembered how God fed their forefathers in the wilderness when they didn't have any food, when God had brought them out of slavery Using Moses as their leader, he brings them out of slavery. They had no food. They're out there in the wilderness. They're complaining. They're going to starve to death. And what does he give them? That's right. Manna from heaven. Magic bread that would appear 
every morning on the ground. And they would have enough for the day. And the next day, there'd be manna. And they'd have enough for that day. And then the next day. So every day they're relying on the provision of God to satisfy them, to sustain them, to keep them alive as they move towards the promised land. And they remember that. And they remember Moses saying, there's going to come a day when a prophet comes who's like me, who does things like me, except for he's much better. And they're going, is this him? Is this the Messiah? Is he going to bring us out of like the slavery that we're kind of under to Rome? He's feeding us with bread from heaven. And so they want to take him and make him king. And that's where Jesus like departs. Well, the next day they come back. They won't go away. And Jesus actually looks at him and he says, you're not here because of the sign. You're not here because of what the sign was pointing to. You've come back because you want more bread. You just want me to fill your belly again. You just want your physical, temporary need met. And he says, it is, in essence, we won't read the whole story for time, but he's saying, you missed the point. And they're like, but, but, but Moses gave us bread from heaven. And he said, no, it wasn't Moses, it was God. In fact, in your forefathers who ate that bread, you know what happened to them? Where are they? Oh, they're dead. Your forefathers, they ate the manna, but they died. And Jesus starts to spell out, here's the point of the miracle. Here's the point of the feeding of the 5,000. He says, I'm the bread of life. He says, I've come down from heaven. Listen to this, John 6, 26 and 27. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Here it is. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. So, man, that food perishes, and you'll be just like that food. You'll die. Work, pursue, seek for the food that brings eternal life. Then again in John 6.35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Verses 47 through 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus is saying, yeah, you want your temporary needs met. But I'm not here just to meet temporary needs. I'm meeting these temporary needs as a sign that I have the power and the authority to meet your eternal needs. Not just, okay, yeah, here's a meal to satisfy your physical hunger. No, 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 no. Here's the meal that will satisfy your eternal hunger. Not just satisfy your stomach for four to six hours, but that will satisfy your soul and your deepest longings for joy, peace, and hope, and purpose, and identity for not just the rest of your physical life, but for all of eternity. To bring you back into a relationship with your creator that you were made for, and a relationship that will never end. To bring you out of the kingdom of darkness, out from under the curse of sin, into the kingdom of of Christ, the kingdom of the Son of God, where all there is is hope. And Jesus ends that statement by saying, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, 
the Jews they had a hard time with this, and actually a lot of them freaked out. Even though, hopefully, as we've walked through this, you're picking up on the fact that when Jesus talks about himself being the bread and his flesh being bread, and in a minute he's going to talk about how his blood is like true drink, that he's not literally talking about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. He's using it as a picture for us to understand that, yeah, we have to partake of Christ. But he, he makes it clear. He says, you have to believe in me, that the eating and the drinking is a picture of trusting in Christ, to coming to him for, to meet all of our needs, to be satisfied in him alone. But for some of the Jews, they, they just couldn't get it. Their eyes weren't open to the truth. And they actually leave offended. They're like, man, what's he talking about? eat his flesh and drink his blood like we're not even allowed to touch blood that would make us unclean they, they miss it they don't get it but Jesus is saying no like this is where eternal life is it's in me and he says through my flesh that how just like Jesus took those that boy's crackers and he broke them and there was enough for everyone to receive and to be satisfied, Jesus is saying, just like that, my, my body is going to be broken. That Jesus is going to go to the cross and give his life. His body being broken, his flesh being given, his blood being shed, is all ways of saying, I'm going to the cross to die. To be broken, to have my blood shed, to die for you. So that what I'm offering you is life through my death where your sins can be forgiven. Where your sins can be forgiven. Where the effects of the curse in your life personally can start to be undone. Where your sins can be forgiven. Where fellowship with God can be restored where the consequences of sin can be removed, no longer enslaved in the kingdom of darkness, but made free in Christ, having the wrath of God removed from you and only knowing his love and his mercy and his grace being brought into his family. That, that's what it means to partake of the bread of heaven that's come down, the bread of life, tell you one last quick story I forgot to start my timer so I have no long uh, no idea how long I've been preaching which makes me think it's been like 10 minutes oh there we go I forgot about that thing too 33 okay good I'll tell you a really short story um, uh, when I met my wife uh, we were both working here and she was already really tied into local ministry just in town and there's this one family and it was uh, four kids <laughs> And they all had different dads with the same mom. And so they were in the same house. And uh, they were from elementary school through about eighth grade. And we'd go get them. Uh, there, you know, any men that came through the house wasn't one of their dads. And they were usually pretty violent with them. And the mom uh, was not in a good place. She was not healthy mentally, physically. She was abusing her own body pretty, pretty badly. And so these kids, we got connected with them because of a church that was doing outreach and that we'd bring them out to camp and just try to spend time with them. And, uh, and they were all so, uh, I mean, so underweight. And we'd watch them, and they were always, the on, we only ever saw them eat junk food. I mean, candy, you know, nerds, just whatever stuff that you get at the gas station, which is fine <laughs> in moderation at times, but this was like, this is all they ate. And, and I remember uh, we got them. We we're, we're going to have them uh, at camp. We, we took them uh, to where my wife, before we were married, she was living in a home, and uh, she cooked a dinner for them. And it was, it was awesome. It was like grilled chicken breast and vegetables and, you know, like potato and bread. And just, just for most of us, it would just be a normal meal, right? And they wouldn't touch it. They wouldn't touch it. They had, like they, I mean, they were like gagging at it. They, they just weren't trying to be rude they just 
they had no appetite for it. And it was like, oh, yeah, they've spent all day just eating junk, just filling up with junk. And, th- and the sad part is, like, they feel like their stomach right now is their hunger satisfied. But you can just tell by physically looking at them that they're starving to death. They're not getting nu- the nutrition that they need. And I think, man, I, I remember having these conversations with, with my wife and just being like, man, it's such a picture of when people reject what Christ is offering. Like he's saying to the world, like, I'm the bread of life. <laughs> Come, be satisfied. Experience, like, the purpose for which you were made. Find your identity and your purpose and your meaning and your joy rooted in me. And we turn to the temporary pleasures of sin and we fill up on it day after day after day. And we think that our needs are being met. And it feels like that longing is being satisfied. In reality, we're, we're dying. I think, man, if, that, if you come into this weekend and you don't have a relationship with Christ, my prayer is that as you see these awesome works that Christ has done, that you would not just be, like, interested or blown away by this ancient story of this man performing miracles, that you wouldn't just see, oh, you had to be powerful. No, no, no. You see that, okay, the whole point is pointing you to this was God come to rescue us, come to save us, come to die in our place. Why? To give you hope, to satisfy your deepest longings, not just for this life, but for all of eternity.